Hello, and thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. Appreciate you guys checking this episode out. I, uh, it's now into November a bit. Thanksgiving's coming up soon. I passed my, uh, my birthday on the 11th of November. And so settling into the, the year pretty well, or kind of the new year of, of being uh, 32 now, which is cool. But, uh, but yeah, been uh, hanging out a bit and kind of settling into November and the winter and kind of winterizing some stuff around the house and doing some kind of simple outdoor stuff. So try to keep up with a little bit of some foraging stuff for uh, some chanterelle mushrooms while it's up. But that's sort of shifting over a little bit now that it's a little, uh, a little deeper into the fall. So I'm kind of looking at some other stuff to start doing now that uh, it's been kind of freezing a little bit more regularly. I think now that I've been going out, I'm, I'm finding some more stuff that's a little mushier. And for a lot of the fall, I really noticed how, uh, how it was kind of dry this fall through a lot of October. So a lot of those, uh, those kind of warmer, you know, mid-temperature, 40 to 60 degree days that we would have had with uh, kind of sustained rains... We just didn't really get a lot of that through October, so a lot of the, the fungus growth or a lot of the mushroom growth or the, the chanterelles uh, didn't really take off like I think I saw it do last year. I was still able to get uh, a lot of bags, you know, like a, a good a good bit of a harvest out of the forest every couple of days, but really as it is, it was definitely less than it was last year. I remember like there was times last year where it just seemed, you know, wet for weeks or something. But uh, but when, when I went out, it was just everywhere. You know, they were just kind of popping up out of the road almost. Uh, now when I went out, I saw a bunch of other types of mushrooms, uh, like, you know, some other species, but uh, but not the chanterelle type that I was looking for. And it's kind of interesting to see how the varieties sort of change of what's growing as it gets later into the year. But I've been doing a bit of that. Uh, been doing a bit of other kind of woodsy stuff going out and... Checking out some things, trying to gather up some wood and some firewood and then bring it back and tarp it up in a stack at home and stuff. And um, most of that's for like the outdoor stuff. You know, I don't have like an indoor fireplace, uh, but I've got uh, I've got like a fire pit and like a fire a little stove, like a little cast iron stove that I'm trying to do some <laughs> some burning into, which is kind of fun. I'm trying to set up like an outdoor little workshop spot to do some stuff through the fall and uh, try and do some. I guess, I don't know, it's not really yard stuff, but yeah, trying to do a little bit of, of woodworking project stuff that I've got kind of lined up and sort of some light stuff, but it's kind of fun. I, I've got a big stack of really old redwood, really cool redwood too. It's reclaimed lumber from an old, uh, like an old, I think it's an old railroad tunnel and it was built way back at the turn of the century, like, you know, 1900. Well, actually, I think it was like 1870 that the tunnel was built and it's old long grain uh, redwood that was cut down way back then when they when they were still you know like logging old growth redwood trees out of the out of the California Oregon border area there and uh, yeah it made a, a redwood tunnel I think it caught fire at one point and then they, they pulled a bunch of the wood out and it sat around from the 70s to now <laughs> and I think uh, now I've got a big a pile of it so I'm going to try and take some of the pile of, of uh, redwood and it's charred on one side and then it's like really weathered on the other sides uh so i'm going to go through some of those and see if uh if those pieces are of high high enough quality that i can salvage it or make something out of it or, or make some pieces out of it or add it to some other sets of wood to to make some uh some useful things out of it i sent uh sent a couple planks of it over to be refinished and then made into a tabletop that i have uh, put together for like a cool coffee table and I really like that. I want to do some other stuff like that if I can. And I've got enough planks for it that I could do uh, I could do a few cool projects. So we'll see what I can put together with it. But I'm, I'm trying to do that a little bit right now of uh, setting up a space outside, putting this stack of, of redwood together, and then um, kind of lining out a couple different kind of pieces that I can put together. I'd sort of put together a couple uh, like photo craft pieces before. You know, I, I had a... It was sort of like a photo frame or like a photo clipboard I'd put together a couple of times. I think we also had like a a couple, uh, I guess it would just be sort of like decorative wood pieces that you'd have for like a jewelry holder or an incense holder or some other kind of planked wood tool that you'd have. But uh, but I've been trying to like build out a couple of things like that. Really, I was thinking about photo frames would be kind of cool. I know you need a, a miter saw for that. I think you have to do like this really kind of specific 45 degree angle cut on uh, on those angles so that it all matches up correctly to make that uh, a proper square 
and so I've heard that the the, the making of of uh, homemade picture frames is a little bit more tricky than it sounds like if you really want to get into sort of action or uh, I guess kind of crafting it properly so that you have some some skill in it. But I don't really have many of those tools. I know you can do it like kind of handmade too and just sort of measure it out and cut it down and then uh, sand it into place and, and put it together. Um, so I might do that with the redwood, but I also might uh, use some other kind of uh, you know, pieces of hobby wood or something to do that. The, the redwood is really porous. It's really soft wood. Um, so I'm also kind of interested to see like different ways that that can be treated so that it can be used a little bit more effectively. But like for the tabletop or for some other pieces, it just seems so soft and so light that if it wasn't treated, it seems like you know if you if you wanted to, I don't know, put something on it or you know, put some pressure onto it, you'd, you'd like leave a mark in the wood, which I've definitely, I think, done before too. But setting up some redwood, which has been kind of cool, moving that to the side, um, doing some rock hounding stuff, which has been cool. I've been jumping over to the coast a couple times now. I've been meaning, I haven't done this yet, but I've been meaning to bring over my metal detector. <laughs> I've got a metal detector. I don't want to bring it over to uh, some of like the areas of the steps and some of the areas of like the walkways and beaches as you go out toward the beach from those uh, those sort of major city parks that are sort of those walkways and funnels for the, the public to go down to the beach. I want to go over there with the metal detector and kind of scan through that area to see if I can find any cool stuff, anything that had dropped or had washed up or had uh, come ashore there. I think that'd be kind of fun. I haven't really ever gone out with a metal detector before, but I've seen some people doing it. It sounds uh, kind of like a fun hobby. I think the beach would be a cool spot to to drop over and do it. When I was out there at the beach, I saw some people, they were doing, I, and I might be wrong about this, but I think they were doing like some gold mining. Does that sound right? They were going over to like the creek area as the creek would sort of flow in to the ocean. But then there would be deposits left after the high tide in the sand where the sort of darker black sand would sort of pool up in the in the some of the spots of those, you know, those kind of ripples that you get in the sand as it sort of washes away. But in these little spots where there'd be a deposit of this darker wash of sand, a guy was going on uh, along with like a real small, like just, you know, a regular bucket and a trowel. And he'd go through and he'd kind of do a light, a real thin kind of scoop up of that black, uh, that black sand that's at the top, the top of the water or the top of the sand there. And then put that in the bucket and then take that over to his dish over by the creek, add a little water into it, slosh it around, and then try and wash it down so you get out the iron. And I guess uh, kind of wash it down so you, you get, I guess it's like a more concentrated mix that you can get gold powder out of, or, you know, like those little gold flakes out of when you're doing your prospecting. But, but I think what he could do is kind of go through, sift it down to the heavier contents or you know, I think you, you, I think what you do in the in the gold panning stuff is you sort of throw out the lighter ingredients, and then as the gold, which is heavier, and the iron, which is heavier, kind of wash to the bottom ridges of the pan, then that's when they start to reveal themselves. The lighter silicon stuff gets thrown out in the wash, and then you're able to go through and then pick out those little flakes or uh, specks of gold that might be in there, and then put that in the little collection tube on the side, which is kind of cool. It seems like what he was up to. And something that I'd like to do, I think that'd be kind of fun to go over, try and pick up some of the sifting dirt and then, or sifting sand or whatever it is and go through and uh, try and pick out a couple flakes of gold. It sounds kind of cool. I ran into another guy out there and he was like an agate picker. This is something I want to get into too. I was talking a little bit about agates, how they're formed and how they show up and, and all that. And, and I'd be interested to find out the geology of how some of these creeks have agates formed in them here along the west coast. I think it's kind of cool, the land formation, however the geology is over here. And however that goes back in history of the agate formation of what went on over at the coast there. But I think just north of Newport, there's a beach called Agate Beach. Apparently, a place where there's going to be uh, agates found. But this guy that I was talking to, he was saying, well, he was saying, like, uh, if you kind of prowl around town in these kind of these older, smaller, uh, you know, coastal cities here in Oregon or probably in Washington or wherever they might be. But if you kind of prowl around the, the town, you'll, you'll sort of see these uh, almost, I don't know, kind of just, it, it says rock shop or gem shop or something like that. It's some sort of little shack uh, kind of place with the old 
sort of weathered sign on it that sort of looks goofy. It looks like an old time prospector kind of just works there and kind of does it himself. But I guess you, some of those people, some of those guys, they're some of the, the more invested rock hounds in the area. And some of those guys, if they've retired, I guess, you know, they'll, they'll let up some of their picking spots or they'll let up some of their information on, uh, on what they've done to collect some of these cool rocks and gems over the years. But some of those people in those local town spots have some good, uh, kind of easy starter information for people that are getting into some of the rock counting stuff. But I was told, recommended by a guy over in Newport to try and find a man named Rooster so I could find out about the good rock hounding spots. Sounds fun. I haven't taken him up on it yet, but the guy gave me an agate that he had collected. And <laughs> I guess he was telling me that the good time to go is in the winter time after some of the, the bigger winter storms come in off the coast and then dredge up. Well, I guess not dredge up, but uh, I guess they wash out the light. I guess like we were talking about, they wash out the sand that's kind of coming, those sandbars, they wash out. And then it exposes some of the gravel beds, some of those those rock beds that are a little bit lower down uh, in the sediment. And that exposes some of the beds that have the agates in them. And I guess those come up during low tide in the winter time i guess after what january or february something like that and that's when this guy has found most of the agates that he's uh, spotted out there in areas like uh, agate beach up to up to where i don't know what's up north of there is it the yaquina head or is that below it i can't remember now but it's cool yeah so it's fun going out and doing some uh some agate hounding stuff um and it's, I don't know, it's kind of fun. I like doing that sort of stuff. I like uh, kind of poking around. I want to get out there with the, uh, what was I saying? The, the metal detector. That's the one to get out there with. I think that'd be kind of cool. I was hearing there's a, a number of different things you can do with the metal detector, and it's pretty fun most of the time. In the spots that I've been out, the only thing I've found so far is like casings from, you know, ejected bullets that have been fired out of a rifle over in Eastern Oregon when I've, uh, I guess when someone else had been out there hunting or doing some shooting or whatever it is, and then I've kind of come along through a camp and found some uh, some old shells and stuff laid out in the uh, in the dirt over there in between the sagebrush. Uh, but that's about the the most that I've ever found is like a a cool thing. But I want to go out to the coast see if I can find something fun and cool that's washed up onto the shore. I had some family that lived that over on the coast for for a long time, and you know when they kind of go out to the coast to do their walks and stuff. I think when you have more access to the coast, you're just out there more and they would kind of find some cool stuff that would wash up over the years. I think they'd found like some things that seemed like they were off some Asian fishing boat or some uh, little buoys that would come in or little uh, like crab fishing things that would wash in from our boats or from other boats and stuff. And it'd be really cool. I don't know. It'd be fun to kind of find some of that stuff out on the beach. I think it'd be fun. I was looking at a couple other things that I thought would be kind of neat since it's uh, Christmas coming up soon and since my birthday had just passed. There's a few um, a few kind of like everyday carry things that I was looking into and some of the brands that are sort of around that or what would kind of be a cool one to pick up. But I had uh, been looking into a few different pieces. One of them was pocket knives. I carry a pocket knife with me most of the time. I think before I talked about the Gerber Gator that I carry around, I think it's a about a four-inch blade. And it's a little bit more than a four-inch handle. It's sort of a full-size grip in the hand. I guess what I'm saying there is it, is it extends open to about eight and a half inches or so handle and blade as it's open. And then it's got the locking uh, back, which I like a lot more than kind of that finger release that you would press um, sort of on the, the inside of the blade to kind of push a little bit of metal out of the way so that the blade can kind of fold back and collapse in on itself. I don't really prefer those. And I kind of uh, found at least like the cheaper blades that I've picked up that were like that to start to fail over time where that, that little metal springiness to it that sort of pushes in place uh, starts to kind of wear off or bend out a little bit. And then after a while, it wouldn't really lock in place. It would lock back enough to be there. But then as soon as I put any pressure on it, it would fold back in on itself and come toward my hand and my fingers and stuff while I was cutting. So that had happened, I think, a couple or with a couple knives that I had that were like that a few times. So now when I'm getting a folding pocket knife, I really try and avoid that style of it. There are a bunch of them that are like that and there are a bunch of them that are really pretty cool. And I bet if you buy a higher end brand or, you know, like a better built knife, then you'd probably have better luck with it. But really, I prefer the the, the back that locks on it. So like kind of 
I don't know, maybe three quarters down toward the bottom of the, the handle, there's going to be like a little metal bit that you'd press your thumb into. And that kind of pulls that part of the tang of the knife, lifts a locking release on the blade, and then you're able to swing the hinge of the blade shut to collapse it, fold it, and then put it back in your pocket. Um, I like that kind of style a lot more than uh, than this other type that I was talking about. But when I was looking around, that's what uh, that's what I tried to pick up with the Gerber Gator that I had. And I like the Gerber knives. Um, I've had a couple variants of that style before. I like the kind of rubberized handle. Um, and I like the price, too. It's like 29 bucks, or I think you can get them, I don't know, maybe like on the more expensive end for like 40 bucks. But these uh, these Gerber Gators, the full size, and I think there's a mini. They're pretty good. Um, kind of mid-range, usable, folding kind of pocket knives that you'd have. And I really like it a lot more than uh, some of like the Kershaw stuff that I've had that's sort of at that lower end price point that's like below $20. I've had those for about six months or so, and then some of the some of those hex screws start to unwind on me, and then all of a sudden I've got I've got a knife that's in like four different pieces, washers and bits and stuff kind of all over. And that's happened a couple times with those... Uh, those uh, sort of assembled knives. I try and find some stuff that's like uh, got a certain type of construction on it that keeps it a little tighter together. The hex screws work pretty well. On the higher end pieces, those really do hold together really well over time and they don't have to be dismantled or reassembled. But on some of those less expensive knives, unless you're doing some kind of more regular tool maintenance to keep those bolts tight, they do start to kind of work themselves out on you. And the steel of the blade, I haven't even gotten to that. Um, the steel of the blade changes like all the time or well, I don't know. It doesn't change all the time, but there's a ton of different variations of quality knife steel that goes into these, uh, these folding pocket knives or full tang pocket knives. But, uh, I was kind of looking into that a bit. Like, uh, I guess like what used to be the standard for hard knife steel back 30 years ago, isn't anywhere near the same as it is now. Now there's a whole bunch of different variations of things that they give you different benefits or, or drawbacks. I guess it's like uh, the, there's like steel, but then there's steel that you add chrome into, or that you add a certain amount of nickel into, or that you add a certain amount of carbon into. And these different variants that are added into the metal give the the steel some different properties, and that gives the 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 edge, the blade, the sh- or, you know the the way that the sharpness of that blade reacts to different forces that makes it react differently. So some types of steel are more brittle. But they so they'll like crack if you start axing with it, or but that makes them like hard, I guess, and so that gives you like a stronger edge retention, so you can keep that edge sharp for a long time. But if it's a really durable type of steel, then maybe it's got a softness to it, and so if you start doing a lot of extended cutting with that sharp blade, it'll go dull on you faster, and you'll have to re sharpen the blade, uh, and then it'll lose its sharpness maybe a little faster. But then there's also blades that will rust if they get wet. So if you got a blade that's really sharp and stays really sharp, but rusts quickly when it gets wet at all, then that's like a pretty difficult knife to have around too. And so people kind of choose their knives for different things. I guess there's like boat knives or there's a, there's a certain type of steel that's used for people that are doing a, a lot of stuff on the ocean. Like when they're exposed to a lot of salt water, they uh, use a – it's not uh, – is it like an H1 steel? That doesn't sound quite right. But there's a certain type of steel that they have that's uh, that will not rust, but is like really hard and holds like a really strong edge. And then there's a whole bunch of different variations of hard steels, you know, like steels that have like some stronger amount or, or I guess uh, tougher resistance to whatever elements they're going to be exposed to. So the, the Gerber Gator that I have, that's a, that's a D2 steel. And I guess you can look these steels up. They're going to be probably more informative. Some, some chart online will probably be more informative than, uh, than my breakdown of stuff. But they'll kind of get into the, the chemical compounds of what makes these steels different and what makes the, the knife blade uh, better or worse for the function that you're going for. But really, there is like a tier of not really quite good enough for most things and then where people and knife collectors are kind of trying to pick into uh, for like higher quality knives. And I think it's, uh, it's a good litmus test for how high quality your knife is. So there's some, there's some good steels that make inexpensive knives, 
Um, so I think like for like Victor Knox, uh, Swiss Army knife, you're looking at like a three sixteenth steel, which I think now is like a pretty low grade kind of kind of steel. Even for a lot of buck knives, I think it's like the four four sixteenths or something like that. Or, you know, it's a little more. Um, for I think for Leatherman's too, it's sort of in that area. Then I think if you get into the the SA or Rat three knives, you're looking at ten ninety five steel, which I think is like a higher carbon steel. Uh, then I think you get like D two steel, like this Gerber Gator is. That's sort of in the same zone. There's also this other stuff. This I think Chinese made steels that are. I think it's like seven CR. I got a knife around here somewhere that has it, but it's a. Uh, 7 CR, then there's 8 CR and 9 CR. And it's got like a, a couple other letters after it too. But I think the first couple is like a 7, an 8, or a 9. And I think that's kind of to the degree that it is good, let's say, for this. Or it's like tough steel or whatever it is. But I think 7 is sort of the lower grade, kind of average grade knife blade steel. 8 is pretty good in comparison to a lot of stuff. And 9 is sort of more of a premium and inexpensive uh, steel option made by the Chinese manufacturers. So I have a couple knives that are made with that. There's also another steel called Os 8. I found that around uh, a number of times, and I think that's in some higher end, higher end knife blade pieces too. Uh, also used by some higher end knife manufacturers. Um, I think with some stuff from Benchmade and some stuff from Spyderco. I've seen in the Os 8. And let me pull it out here. I was actually kind of thinking about Spyderco and Benchmade and the Columbia River Knife and Tool. Um, let's see, what are those? Columbia River Knife and Tool, Benchmade. There's another one I'm trying to think of. It's a, it's a port that's a, like an Oregon-based knife company. Yeah, I didn't know there. I didn't realize there were so many Oregon-based knife companies up around this area. But uh, then, uh, then there's also a Spyderco. That's another uh, knife manufacturer that I was, uh, I was looking at. I think those are Japanese. Uh, but I picked up a Spyderco knife recently. Those are a lot more expensive than, uh, you know, kind of like a lot of the average run-of-the-mill pocket knives that you'd probably pick up in a lot of store or you know, like a lot of more basic um, supermarket-style stores. I don't know why you're getting a hunting knife at a supermarket, but not so much a hunting knife, but really just like useful folding knives that are good pocket knife tools. Uh, but I picked up the Spyderco knife, and I definitely noticed the uh, the difference in some of the quality of it, uh, just in kind of the way that the construction is, the sharpness of the blade, the way that it works. And this is, I think, um, VG10 steel on the blade. And then it's got some sort of like... Uh, what polycarbonate nylon handle? Wow, whatever that is, you know. But uh, the the handle works really well. Then I was also looking at G10, which is another handle material that I see listed out there on a number of knives, and that seems to be sort of one of the higher end knife handle options. I see that on like the higher end um, Columbia River Knife and Tool M16 knives, and I see that as an option for. Uh, the nicer like bench made knives. I was looking at some bench made knives like the Griptilian. I think that has a G10 handle option. Uh, also the the bench made bug out. I was looking into that knife, um, and that I think has a, a G10 handle too. But I think that kind of provides sort of a kind of a powdery grip almost to it. I think it's another uh, kind of composite material. But it's got uh, a good grip on it so that you, you can still kind of uh, maintain a, a handle even into the sort of wet or slippery conditions. Another knife I had used micarta on the handle, uh, which is, I think, layered. I tried to do this before my on my own, and I've seen someone make it themselves before too. But I think it's um, it's like layered and then sanded down fiberglass and linen or fiberglass and denim or like resin and denim or something like that but i've seen uh, people kind of like layer they would like soak they kind of penetrate just like uh if you take like a bunch of like little sheets i would say like linen in this case but something kind of with like a thatched texture uh, but you take a bunch of sheets of this and then you penetrate that 
with uh, fiberglass resin and then lay that down and then add another layer of it, lay that down and add another layer and lay that down. And then you clamp all that together and then let it cure. That makes this kind of like real compressed brick of these stacked up pieces of fabric that are kind of interlaced together with each other. And then they're now fused together and kind of frozen in place with this, uh, this fiberglass resin to like sort of this sort of solid block. And then what you're able to do is saw right through that, and then you have this kind of uh, solid and grippable, sandable material that you can kind of scrape down and shape into whatever kind of size or shape piece you want. So I have some scales to a Fultang pocket knife over here that has uh, micarta handles. And I think it's kind of a cool handle type. It works well for, uh, for some of the stuff. But there's also like a lot of other options out there or it's that's a, something I thought about it when I got it. And sort of what I think about like the G10 uh, handle stuff, too, is that there's just like a lot of handle options out there. And uh, that's kind of the tricky thing, too, is like um, like I look around it. I don't know how to get into it, really, but like I look around at like um, bushcrafting videos. You know, I might have talked about this before even or I've had the thoughts before, too, about uh, I like bushcrafting or like kind of the idea of a lot of like outdoorsmanship stuff and a lot of like outdoors uh, travel and use of the landscape. And I think kind of have an understanding of that is really cool. Uh, but the bushcrafting stuff sort of has some little twists or like sort of limitations to it that I think sometimes make it a little, a little goofy. But uh, part of the idea is you have like a big knife, almost close to a machete that you use for everything from batoning down two inch thick trees to I guess like just building a trap to hunt small animals to to just straight hunting or combat or whatever it is, but it's supposed to be this kind of all purpose wilderness tool. Those are cool knives, and I do have a couple of those in that size range. I like the four inch size probably most a lot of the time, but for a lot of cool stuff, it's like the the five inch knife, like a five inch full tang knife. It's really cool if you're going to try and do some of that stuff. But really, at that point, or kind of my thinking around it is like that's almost too all purpose of a tool that you're trying to apply a knife to. You know, like uh, you don't really need maybe to always do that sort of stuff with a knife. Now, it's cool when you understand how to use a knife and then you can really build out stuff while you're in the woods or while you're in the backcountry that you didn't have to bring in with you. So that is like a cool kind of survivalist mechanism of not even survivalist, but just when you're in the woods. Um, there's a way that you can build out a lot of stuff that you would maybe think that you would need to bring with you. Just kind of a lot of like structural stuff that you can kind of set up or, or make some makeshift elements with if you know how to do some simple things with a knife. And I've heard of, uh, of like these practice, these practice systems called uh, tri sticks. You could probably look that up like a, like, I don't know, a bushcraft tri stick or something like that. But it's this bushcraft skills thing where, you go through with a twig, you know, like kind of a two foot long stick that's about an inch and a half in diameter. And then you, you try out a bunch of these different cut maneuvers on it. So you kind of like a flat cut, a scooped cut, uh, sort of like a pointed carve or to make like a divot in something or make, you know, just like all these different little pieces that you kind of go through and do. And I guess there's like uh, some little system of those that you can use those pieces on a stick as different tools to make you know, different, I don't know, different things. Who knows what they are? I've seen like snowshoes made. I've seen tables made. I've seen um, like fire pit cooking kitchens made. <laughs> I've seen a few different pieces and stuff. So it's kind of interesting to see what people can kind of throw together. Really, a lot of the time, I think what it was used for as a plan is what you see expressed by the bush crafters is you got a big knife and then you whack down a chunk of a tree. You make a a stand to hold a pot over a fire to purify your water. And then you make sort of an A-frame to throw your tarp over so that you have your dry shelter. Now, I think both of those are really one of the least effective means of providing that thing in the outdoors. So like, you know, I, I don't know how to really say it now, but it's like uh, it's good to know how to start a fire and it's good to know how to stay out in the wilderness if you only have a tarp. Also, it's good to bring a tent and a sleeping bag and it's good to bring a jet boil and some fuel and a lighter. And those two things really like cut down on the amount of 
weird sort of dangers that you would have from exposure or risk of bad water or whatever it is. So a lot of the time, what I'm thinking about trying to do some outdoor stuff is how to like cut down on a lot of the extra work or the extra danger um, of some of those risks that you would have to sort of put yourself out into if you're trying to drink unpurified water through a sort of haphazardly made heavy can over a fire pit for an hour or two or whatever it is, or staying under a tarp when you have way better and less expensive survival gear or, you know, like uh, tent hunting, camping gear, backpacking gear available to you. Um, so I think that those are kind of the options to sort of steer into. So that kind of brings me to, well, what is a knife and what do you do with a knife? And so for bushcrafting, you're supposed to like build everything that you would go camping with. And I kind of think, well, maybe that's not really what I use a knife for. Uh, or what a lot of people use a knife for, and I, I've seen it kind of, uh, kind of more clearly expressed that like you, your knife, or like eight, you could have a couple different knives, but it's cool to have a knife that's really just for cutting and kind of keeping it as sort of a, a, a more sacred discipline to keep that knife sharp as something that can really do an effective job uh, cutting, cutting into flesh if you need to do some hunting stuff, or cutting ropes, or cutting parts of whatever you're trying to put together out in the outdoors or whatever it is. And so I think that's kind of like some of the interesting stuff about uh, about doing some knife preparation stuff. And there's a lot to get into with sharpening and different sharpening stones and some some thoughts that I have about some sharpeners and sharpening stuff that I want to get into too. But I don't know, I kind of might wrap it up there for uh, for this part of the podcast. And I'll probably come back in with a part two of things to do with your pocket knife that... Uh, that are useful when you're doing some outdoor stuff. And I guess I could bring it around the photo stuff too. Kind of like what I'm saying is when I'm traveling light and I'm outside in sort of more of my normal circumstances, like a two and a half to three inch folding pocket knife really gets by uh, in almost every circumstance that I've needed. And I really don't need that big of a knife. I really just need a small amount of that blade or, you know, I need a small blade to be really sharp. And I think with that, you can be really effective, like with a scalpel, you know, you can go through and do like a lot of significant and proper work with just a scalpel. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a, a bigger or more broad or more thick blade is going to be a superior tool to just really the act of cutting and slicing or the act of like trying to chop into something that you're, uh, you're trying to do with a, a pocket knife when you're carrying it around out in the woods with you. But thanks a lot for checking out this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. You can see more of my work at billynewmanphoto.com. You can check out some of my photo books on Amazon. I think you can look up uh, Billy Newman under the authors section there and see uh, some of the photo books on film, on the desert, on surrealism, on camping. Some cool stuff over there. You can check out the website for more podcasts uh, similar to this one. You can also go to billynewmanphoto.com forward slash support to find out different means and locations that you can go about uh, financially supporting the efforts put into making this podcast and making some of the photo stuff and some of the outdoor visual content that you might find from the work that I'm doing. But appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks a lot for listening to this episode of the podcast and I will talk to you again next time. Bye.